Let me ask you a question. What are you going to do this weekend? Whatever your plans are, forget about them. Never mind the dinners or clubs or movies or video games or whatever else you are thinking about doing. Because you're about to discover how to do something that is going to blow your mind and change your life. And you can do it this weekend or any other time you have a couple of days to spare. What is this life-changing thing? Well, it's brainstorming a million-dollar business idea. You heard me right. You're about to find out how to quickly brainstorm, research, and even test a million-dollar business idea in just a couple of days, all from the comfort of your living room. Sounds totally crazy, right? Yet, the system you're about to discover is the exact method used by countless business owners to develop million-dollar business ideas. The two top marketers who developed this system have personally used it to create multiple seven-figure businesses, and this same system is used every day by entrepreneurs to brainstorm their next big idea. In other words, this isn't just somebody's guess about how to brainstorm a million-dollar business idea. This is a proven system. And now for the first time ever, you can use it to brainstorm the business idea that might just make you rich and change your life. Maybe you'll be the next big success story of someone who brainstormed a tiny idea one weekend that goes on to become a wildly profitable business. I'm talking about success stories like Google, YouTube, eBay, Whole Foods, Dell Computers, and countless other million and even billion dollar businesses that started from one simple idea hatched in someone's living room, dorm room, or even their garage. Listen, if someone without any special qualifications or background can hatch a billion dollar business idea in their living room, then you can certainly brainstorm some amazing business ideas that could be worth millions to you, and this course is going to show you how to do it. Just think about it for a second. I bet you can already picture your name in print as countless media outlets and bloggers talk about your little idea that exploded into a profitable business. Maybe you can picture yourself sitting in an office that just screams wealth and power, the executive leather chair, the rich mahogany desk, and the computer setup that would make the folks at Google headquarters blush. And you can just imagine yourself finally living the life you always knew you would, the house, the cars, the vacations. Maybe right now all of that seems a bit out of reach, but let me tell you something. You're just one million dollar business idea away from getting everything you've always wanted, and you're just 48 hours away from coming up with that idea. That's right, we're going to do this together, and you can start today. Introducing Million Dollar Brainstorm, the first video training program of its kind to show you the secrets of quickly brainstorming, researching, and testing million dollar business ideas. It doesn't matter if you have no idea where to start. It doesn't matter if you've never been much of a brainstormer. It doesn't even matter if you have zero experience running a business, because this program is designed to unlock your creativity and help you uncover the million dollar ideas that are hidden all around you. People who come up with million dollar ideas aren't doing it based on luck, and they don't possess some superhuman power, extraordinary talent, or genius IQ either. These are just everyday people who are like you, with one tiny exception. These successful people know the secrets for brainstorming and researching million dollar ideas. But the good news is, after you watch this course, you too will know the same secrets and be able to do the same thing. So let me tell you what all's inside this exciting video training program. First off, you'll discover how to tap into the profitable ideas that lay hidden all around you. Once you know where to look, you won't be able to stop the flow of great ideas. You'll get the crucial strategy for telling the difference between an average idea and a million dollar idea that will change your life. This is huge because so many people don't know the difference and they gamble everything on something that just isn't going to work. You'll get the seven surefire ways to find out exactly what your market wants to buy. This is like dropping yourself directly into a river full of money. Plus, you'll even discover a surprisingly quick and dirty way to find out if people will really buy your product or service without you spending a single dime or a single minute creating the product. And you know what? It's easy. You'll also find out how to get some crazy good intel on your market by spying on your competition. This strategy is awesome because it lets them do all the hard work while you sit back and collect the easy money. Now here's another thing. You'll get a surefire strategy that virtually guarantees you'll bank money on the day you launch, even if you're starting from scratch today. Plus, you'll find out which old school marketing strategies just don't work anymore and what you should be doing instead to generate big paydays for yourself. Another thing you'll love about this course are the insider growth secrets. 
I'm talking underground strategies the world's top marketers use to set themselves apart from the competition and to roll out products blazingly fast. If you're looking to build your business and your bank account fast, you'll want to use these proven strategies yourself. Seriously here, you're going to learn the secret sauce that makes the difference between having an awesomely profitable business and one that flops around like a dying fish. Plus, I'll show you the exact strategy and tools you need to research and implement your idea so you can get your product to market as quickly as possible and start pocketing cash. So listen up. Look around all you want, but you won't find a better way to brainstorm business ideas, test them, and get them to market fast so you can start making bank. And the best part is that your million dollar business idea is just two days away. Two days. Look, you've waited all your life to uncover it. You've dreamed about this for so long, it seems like forever. You've wanted it so bad that it almost physically hurts. Maybe you've even looked at other successful businesses and wondered why you didn't come up with the idea yourself. Worse yet, maybe you had a good idea but didn't know it would work, so you didn't launch it. Then someone else swooped in and made a killing with your idea. And you know what? You're probably just tired of being like everyone else, running a business that barely gets by because you know you're capable of so much more. It all changes right here, right now. Because your big million dollar idea is coming in just two days. And all you have to do is get ready to jump on it when you see it. And that's what this course does for you. It shows you how to uncover a big idea, jump on it, and run with it all the way to the bank. These next two days are going to change your life. They're absolutely going to blow your mind and rock your world. So get started by clicking the buy button below right now because you don't want another minute to get between you and the most profitable business idea you've ever had in your life. Go ahead, click that button now to change your life. You're going to be very glad you did. Picture this. It's September of 1995 and a young 28-year-old man by the name of Pierre is sitting in his living room putting the final coding touches on his personal website. This website includes information about the Ebola virus, although not very many people are going to remember that little fact in just a few short years. What makes Pierre's website memorable is that he's created a marketplace, an auction site, which he calls Auction Web, and the first thing he sells on his site is a broken laser pointer for only $14.83. This surprises Pierre so much that he calls his buyer to make sure the guy actually knows that the laser pointer was broken. Well, turns out the buyer knew, but that's what he did of all things. He collected broken laser pointers. Now fast forward to the summer of 1996. Pierre's little auction site has cleared $10,000 in revenue already, and it's continuing to grow, so Pierre hires his first employee. By 1997, Pierre's site had grown so rapidly that he was able to secure $6.7 million in funding from a venture capital firm, and this was right around the time that Pierre Omidyar's auction web site was renamed to eBay. Now, I probably don't have to tell you the rest of the story, because unless you're living under a rock, you're well aware that eBay is a large, matter of fact, huge, profitable, and extremely successful business. It was all started by one guy brainstorming an idea in his living room, though. Some people might think that eBay was just some weird kind of fluke of a company that started with a little idea and blossomed into a successful business. But if you look around, you're going to see plenty of these kind of success stories. Think about Dell Computers, which was started by a college kid in a dorm room. Or what about Google, which was originally housed in the founder's garage? Or even Starbucks Coffee? That business was started by three friends who all chipped in about $1,300 each. Not much money. They modeled their first store after another successful coffee house. Well, after a few bumps in the road, they developed a business model that worked. It really worked. And Starbucks became a worldwide brand. And the stories go on and on with companies you know, such as Apple, Whole Foods, Amazon, and even Coors Beer. But the best part is that for every well-known business that started small and grew big, there are probably hundreds of stories from successful individuals who are doing the same thing. Now I know these examples are of massive billion-dollar-plus companies, but think of it. If a multi-billion-dollar company can get its start from one little idea, 
and an operation run out of a garage or living room even, then surely you can come up with a million dollar idea. And here's the good news. There are plenty of people who've blazed the trail before you and proved that it could be done. You can do this too. And I'm going to show you how. You're going to learn the exact steps that people like Simon Hodgkinson and Jeremy Gislason take to quickly brainstorm, research, test, and develop profitable ideas. And if you just devote the next two days to working on what you discover inside this course, you could walk away with your very own million-dollar idea. Maybe you already have an idea. If you do, that's fantastic. You'll find out how to refine it, test it, and develop it into a true seven-figure idea. Maybe you have a whole bunch of ideas, but you don't even know where to start or which one you should pick. This course is going to help you with that too. Or perhaps you're coming into this course with a dream of building a successful business, but you have no idea what kind of product or service you could even offer to turn your dream into a reality. No problem there either. This course is going to walk you through the steps. Point is, it doesn't matter where you're starting today, because within the next few days, you're going to have a million dollar idea. So, you might be wondering how you're going to brainstorm and develop this idea. You're going to do it in three main steps, which is what you'll find out how to do inside the course. So let me give you a quick overview of what you'll be discovering in this series of videos. Step one is brainstorming and researching your idea. If you already have an idea, this step will help you refine your idea to make sure that you're on the right track. That's important. If you're starting from scratch, this module will work you through the entire process of brainstorming a great idea quickly and easily. Listen, by the time you finish this module, you'll be like the Michael Jordan of brainstorming. Okay, now step two is where you'll assess the market. This is where you're going to do some quick and dirty research to find out if your idea truly does have a million dollars worth of potential. You'll find out quick ways to get a feel for what your market wants how to scope out the competition, and how to crunch numbers in just a simple little formula that's going to show you what your idea is really worth. Have you ever played poker and drew a royal flush? Remember the adrenaline rush you got? Remember how excited you were? This is a step where you'll recapture that feeling. Because the moment you realize your idea is worth a lot of money, <laughs> it's going to be the moment you feel like you've hit the jackpot. Now, once you've confirmed that your idea has at least a million dollars worth of potential, then you'll move on to the last step. Step three is where you'll test your idea. This is where you're going to release your idea out into the wild and let your customers vote with their wallets. But the good news here is that you don't need to slave away for months or pour your life savings into your product. That's because you'll discover two quick and dirty ways to test your market even if your product or service isn't ready to launch yet. It's really a pretty simple and straightforward process. It's not that difficult. But what's exciting is that this is the same process countless other people have used to think up brilliant ideas, which then went on to become profitable businesses. Now it's your turn. Just one solid idea, one intense weekend, one million dollars. So let's go ahead and move on to the next module and we'll get started. Accelerated Brainstorming and Research. In this module, you're going to learn about several different things, and I just wanted to list those for you real quick so you know what's coming up. We're going to talk about opening the door, tapping your inner Einstein, filling your bucket in the ocean, reviewing your research, and then finally, we'll do a quick recap to tie it all together before moving on to the next module. So let's go ahead and start with Section A, Opening the Door. Jim Rohn said, Ideas can be life-changing. Sometimes all you need to open the door is just one more good idea. So guess what? There's a brilliant, life-changing idea already tucked away inside your brain. If you're lucky, that brilliant idea has already revealed itself to you. And you're probably hopping around like a kid on Christmas morning, ready to turn your idea into a reality. If that's the case with you, well, great. You're already well ahead of the vast majority of people that I talk to. All you have to do is take a look at this module just to double check that you're on the right track. In fact, working through this module might help you uncover an even better idea. Now, if you're wringing your hands and worried because you don't have an idea yet, you can just relax, okay? The good news is that you will have a genius idea and you'll have it soon. 
All you have to do is walk through this module step by step, and together we'll uncover a life-changing business idea that's going to rock your world. So here's what you're going to do. Step one, recognize the ideas that are all around you. In other words, you're going to do some good old-fashioned brainstorming. Step two, you'll research your idea. If you want to create a product or a service that's virtually guaranteed to sell like hotcakes, then you need to find out what your market is already buying. And then just give them something similar. That's what you'll do in this step. Step three is reviewing your research. In this final step, you'll weed through your ideas and choose the one that looks the most promising. Three simple steps. Easy. Not only will you look like an absolute genius when you get to the end of this process, but you'll also be well on your way to developing a seven-figure business idea. So please go ahead and move on to the next section and we'll get started. In this section, we're going to talk about tapping your inner Einstein. You know, I've seen a lot of people give just a few minutes of serious thinking to what kind of business ideas they could pursue. Then they just toss up their hands in the air and say, well, I can't think of anything. (sighs) Seriously, come on. Is that all you got? Albert Einstein used to say, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. In other words, he devoted more than just one or two minutes of serious thinking to a problem. And if you want to come up with a great idea, then you need to tap into your inner Einstein. This is how you do it. First, you need to decide who your customers are going to be. In other words, to whom are you going to sell your products and services? Second, brainstorm solutions that you're going to offer these customers. In other words, what type of product or service are you going to sell to these customers? In general, you should start by coming up with a market first. That means, who are you going to sell things to? Golfers, business people, college students who want to lose weight, parrot owners, maybe people who like to restore cars, javelin throwers who want to become better athletes. You get the idea. We could go on and on. The potential markets out there are basically limitless. In order to start figuring out your market, just look around you and ask yourself these questions. What are my hobbies? What are my interests? What are my problems? What hobbies, interests, and problems do my friends, family, and colleagues have? What kinds of things are other people interested in? Let me give you a few examples. Let's say you just got a puppy. There you go. Dog owners are a potential market. Your friend is learning to scuba dive. That's a potential market. Maybe your cousin is trying to lose weight before her wedding. There's a potential market also. You see on the news a piece about a large number of people connecting to Facebook through their mobile phones. That's a potential market. Your sister decides she's going to start knitting cute little sweaters for her hamsters. Okay, I'm not sure if there's much of a demand there, but that is a potential market. And those hamsters will look just darling in their little sweaters, right? The point is, look around and you'll discover dozens, hundreds, possibly even thousands of potential markets depending on how long you brainstorm or how much research you do. Just remember what Einstein said. Stick with the problem for a while, and you're bound to brainstorm up a genius solution. Once you've picked out a couple of good market ideas, then your next task is going to be to brainstorm what types of products or services you'd like to offer these prospective customers. Then ask yourself these questions. What is the biggest problem this market faces? What types of solutions would I like to use? Where do the existing solutions fall short? And how could existing products or services be made better? Take some time and really think about the answers to these questions. For best results, use the worksheets inside the included manual that goes along with this course to help you brainstorm both markets and solutions for these markets. You'll want to take note, though, that you may not come up with a product or service idea just from brainstorming alone. This is particularly true if you're not overly familiar with a particular market. If that happens to be the case with you, don't worry about it, okay? That's because in the next section, you'll find out how to spy on your market to find out what they want. When you've finished your brainstorming, then move on to the next section and let's dig into some fun research. 
In this section, I'm going to talk about filling your bucket in the ocean. Now, I know this seems like a little bit of an odd topic, but if you'll bear with me for just a minute or two, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Let's imagine for a moment there's two people who are each carrying empty five-gallon buckets, and their task is to fill these buckets up with water. Joe goes to the Sahara Desert and starts adding a few thimblefuls of water here and there as he finds it. As you can imagine, that'd be pretty slim pickings. Meanwhile, Jack goes to the ocean, takes a few steps in, and fills his bucket instantly. Mission accomplished. Not only that, he can refill his bucket a million times if he wants to. It's kind of a silly story, right? But a lot of entrepreneurs seek out the Sahara Desert of customers, and all they do is struggle. They fool themselves with mirages, like thinking a lot of traffic to a website means a lot of money. Eventually, their whole business collapses like a thirsty man under the hot desert sun. So, here's what I suggest. Bring your business bucket to the ocean of customers. That means delivering solutions to people who are already spending vast amounts of money in the market. Find an ocean of customers in cash, and then all you have to do is go swimming in it. How do you find this ocean of cash? By using the following seven methods for discovering what your market wants. The first method is to browse Amazon. As you probably already know, Amazon is a huge marketplace where people can buy and sell just about anything under the sun. Some people, however, tend to think that Amazon is only useful for information authors who want to sell physical books or Kindle books. But Amazon is one of the biggest marketplaces online, and thus it has a wealth of data and information and opportunity. Amazon carries a huge variety of products across a staggering number of niches. I mean, people are selling everything from iPod cases to concealed toilets to inflatable dinosaurs and drinking games to hiking shoes to dog treats to baby toys and Star Wars t-shirts, uh, lawn games, water skis, protein powder and diamond rings. You get the idea, right? The selection is absolutely enormous. If a product exists, there's a good chance it's already on Amazon. And because Amazon ranks their best-selling products and lets customers review them, you can get a ton of information off this site. So here's what you need to do. And I'm going to go ahead and go over to my browser real quick and show you what Amazon has to offer. What you need to do is, in the search bar on Amazon, go ahead and insert a few broad keywords that are related to your target market. If you already know exactly what kind of product you want to research, then just enter in the appropriate search, something like organic pest spray, as an example. Otherwise, you can use a broad search, like dog training, or organic gardening, or javelins. So let me give you an example. If you enter a really broad search term, like organic gardening, you're going to find things like organic gardening books, gardening videos, gardening tools like trowels and hose, uh, vegetable seeds, soil additives, slug control powder. You can just browse page after page. You just scroll down, hit next page. And these first few pages of results, there's mostly books there. But as you go on, which I did a little bit earlier, I found things like work socks and hemp gardening gloves, tree fertilizer spikes, hydroponic starting kits, um, fungicide, organic gardening hats of all things, kelp fertilizer. Okay, and the list just goes on and on. There's all kinds of things that you can find under that broad search term. Ideally, what you want to do is go ahead and narrow down your search by department. That's because choosing a department allows you to sort your search according to popularity. So for example, we'll go over here on the left and choose patio, lawn, and garden. And it's going to show you all the seeds, tools, fungicides, insecticides, and similar products. You're looking for two things. You're looking for best-selling products and also the customer's thoughts about these products.
And all you need to do once you're in a department is search, or excuse me, sort by relevance, new and popular. Okay, that shows you some of the most popular items in that segment. And you can get an idea of how many of each of these items are selling by looking at their review ratings here. Each product has a one out of five star rating. And next to it, there's a number, for instance, this flea trap, 1,249. That's not 1,249 sales, that's 1,249 reviews. And it's pretty well established that the amount of people who actually take the time to leave reviews is minuscule compared to the amount of sales. This says 1,249 reviews. The amount of sales could actually be 10 times, 50 times, even 100 times more than that. And obviously, you're looking for best-selling products because you want to know what your market is already spending their money on. As we've done, you choose your category to search in. Then Amazon lets you sort those searches according to popularity like we've done here. Ideally, you should be looking for evidence that there is a buying market. If you see several of the same types of products competing in a niche, that's a good sign there's plenty of buyers. Let's take a classic example. Search for something like weight loss on Amazon. Let's take a peek at that. Well, there's not much in weight loss in patio lawn and gardening, so we'll uh, scroll back to all departments for that. Okay, here's the results. You're going to find thousands, and I mean thousands, of books, diet aids, pieces of exercise equipment, and a whole lot more. That would be your sign that it's an enormous market. The second method for filling your bucket in the ocean is just finding out what eBayers are buying. eBay is another place where you can buy and sell really just about anything. You just type in your broad keywords to see what kind of solutions people are selling in your niche market. Let me go ahead and flip over to my browser again real quick and we'll take a look at a couple of examples. Let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples uh, for small dogs, okay? Um, small agility courses. We'll take a peek at that. And it shows 71 results here. Now, the trick here on eBay is not to just look at the current auctions. You can also click on the advanced search options and take a look at the completed auctions. And I'll show you my process for looking at those here in just a second. But what we're looking for is items with a lot of activity and items that always or almost always sell. And for small agility courses, I'm not real excited seeing the number 71 up there. I see some t-shirts. I see one dog agility course for small dogs and some items that are related to that, some, some jumping things, some books. Okay, that's not telling me there's a whole lot of market, at least on eBay, for this kind of item. Maybe I'll go ahead and refine my search just a little bit. Uh, we'll call it small dog agility course singular. See if that gives us anything better. No, it still comes up with 71. And let's take a look at the sold and completed listings and see if anything uh, more has been going on there. Sold listing zero. That's not good. Let's look at completed. Also zero. Okay, this example, there's just nothing there. Don't waste your time pursuing niche products that there isn't already activity in the marketplace for. And really, you want a lot of activity, not just a little anyway. So let's uncheck completed auctions, go back to the live auctions and try something a little different here. How about small dog clothes? Okay, now we're talking. We've got 13,800 and something live auctions. Okay. We got all kinds of sub options for searching different uh, types of small dog clothes. And again, we'll wanna look at the sold listings and completed listings. Let's look at completed first. Okay, almost 21,000 completed auction for small dog clothes. Now we're talking, we've got some motion here. You can scroll down and hone in on what type of small dog clothes are actually selling and what aren't, and also at what price points, that's very important. 
But we're going to compare that to the sold listings. Okay, we got 21,000 completed. And where'd that go? Sold listings. All right, almost 10,000 out of 21,000 have sold. So about 50%. That's not bad. I would like to see a little bit higher percentage. But in this kind of, uh, well, small dog closes a little bit on the broad side, I would say. You're going to have in something this broad uh, a tremendous amount of variety. There's going to be products that simply don't sell. And you're going to have specific products that do sell great within this. So you can hone down your searches a little bit more. If you want to focus on these lovely puppy ties, look, you know, they're selling for a dollar each. You might want to do a search for that and see if they consistently sell for a dollar. Or look at dog tutus. They sell for a little bit more. That might be more worth pursuing. And so on. But you see here, just at a, at a quick check of a couple of boxes, we see 21,000 ended, completed auctions versus about 10,000 sold. We know that it's selling. And we know that it's selling a lot in this category. So if you see, like in our first example, a lot of auctions that have no bidders or winners or not even any items for sale, that's a terrible sign, right? You want to sell products that are both popular and that also have a large market of buyers. If you're thinking there's a chance that you'd like to sell software or mobile phone applications, then you'll want to find out what types of apps are selling well. Your first stop is the apple.com iTunes store, especially if you're interested in selling apps for iPhones or other Apple products. And we'll take a look at the Android store also. First, you'll just want to go to itunes.apple.com and find the App Store. We're there. We can look in, uh, let's say, the health and fitness category. And you can see what kinds of apps are available and find the most popular apps in the category. You'll also be able to read customer reviews to find out what people like or don't like about particular apps. Uh, I'm going to take a peek at this Nike Plus running app. This is one that I actually know a little bit about. It's a free app. And we can see here it's got very good ratings, 67 ratings, four star, um, not five star, four star, it's not bad. Okay, so there's probably somewhere to improve on this. Now from the various running forums, I'm kind of a runner, so I check out some running forums sometimes. I happen to know that for the most part, people like this Nike Plus app. The one thing that's mentioned often about it is it doesn't allow you to export your data um, to other systems. So it kind of holds your data hostage. Now, one way that a person might be able to improve on the Nike Plus app would be to come up with something with similar functionality that also allows you to export data. So that kind of hits all the positives. And that would be one that could be a contender as a competitor to the Nike app. Now remember, there's not just one running app out there. There's, a, there's dozens of them. Some are better than others. There's a few that dominate the market. How do the ones get to the point where they dominate the market? They make a great product. They listen to feedback. They find out what people want, and then they build it. And that's exactly what you'll do with your million-dollar idea. All right, the next stop is the Android store. Android has a pretty big slice of the pie, so you don't want to just ignore Android. Most app developers are developing for the iPhone and also for Android. Okay, so you just go to play.google.com and you can look in the App Store section and browse, let's see, the top charts. Shows us the top free apps, the top paid apps, uh, top grossing, and several other categories to get an idea of what's really at the top of the market. Again, you can drill down into this and find apps that are not at the top because they don't have such a large market, but they may have a real niche market. And there may be a ton of opportunity in the smaller niche markets for apps to improve upon what's already there. You may even find a market that's being grossly underserved with apps or maybe not even being served at all. And if you haven't discovered this already, take note that amazon.com also has an app store you just click on the shop by department drop down and there's the app store for Android. Take a look at the apps. 
And again, find your apps, look for popular apps, and read the reviews. And of course, you can also just run a Google search for a term like best apps. There you'll discover blogs and other websites where various users have reviewed, rated, and ranked what they consider the best apps. If you find something that looks promising, you can do further research in the app stores to find out if the product is indeed popular. Method number four, discover what people are asking about. Think about the last time you had a problem. Maybe you had a leaky chimney in your house, or maybe you had stretch marks on your belly. Maybe you just didn't know what to serve at an upcoming dinner party. What did you do? I'm going to guess that you probably asked someone, right? It could have been someone online, or maybe you asked a friend. But you probably didn't bust a brain cell trying to figure it out all by yourself. And you're not alone. When people have a problem, they often ask questions about how to solve that problem. And if you're interested in creating an information product, like a book, then you'll want to know what people keep asking about in your prospective niche. There's a lot of places you can find these answers, but two great ones are Quora.com and JustAnswer.com. LinkedIn Answers also used to be a good place for research, but they no longer support that feature of the site. You've probably also heard a lot about Yahoo Answers. The problem with Yahoo is that you have to spend a lot of time weeding through the juvenile Beavis and Butthead type questions. It's much better to go to Quora or Just Answer, both of which have a much more professional atmosphere. Again, all you have to do is enter in your broad niche keywords, like dog training as an example, and you'll find out what people want to know. Look for a pattern of the same types of questions popping up over and over again as that's a sign that it's a common problem. But take note, just because someone asks about a solution doesn't mean they're gonna buy it. So use this research to help confirm your other findings, but never use this method all by itself. Another nifty way to find out what people want is to find out what sorts of queries they're typing into search engines. You can do this by using any number of keyword tools from free tools like the Google Keyword Tool to more sophisticated tools like MarketSamurai.com. I'll just bounce over to my browser again real quick here and show you the Google Keyword Planner. Okay, so in your AdWords account, you just gotta sign up for that, it's free, you can find the Keyword Planner and you'll be under the tab Tools and Analysis. And we're just gonna do a search for new keyword and ad group types. Okay, once again, just enter your broad keywords into the tool and let the tool show you what people want. Be sure to enter in multiple similar terms. For example, uh, entering both lose weight and weight loss into separate queries will give you a better picture of the overall market. We'll click ideas there, it'll bring it all up. And you can see here that it shows a whole bunch of related terms with the number of average monthly searches, the level of competition, and a whole lot more data. And that's all highly useful. But another great thing about using this keyword planner is that you can also look for keywords that suggest the searcher is a buyer. For example, a result like buy poodle house training book gives you a great indication of what the buyer wants. When you're searching for these keywords, try to think like a buyer, okay? How would you search when you are ready to buy something? Remember, not every keyword is a buying keyword, but some will definitely lead you in the direction of what people are searching for when they're ready to buy and spend their money. Those are the keywords that can be pure gold. Still another way to get a feel for what your market wants is by lurking on the top forums in the niche. Finding these forums is pretty simple. You just run a Google query for your broad topic alongside the word forum or even discussion forum. For example, on the screen, I've got your keyword, which in this case would be sleep disorders, plus the word forum or discussion forum. You combine them together as the example says, Sleep Disorders Forum. Okay, that's gonna bring up the top forums in your niche. Check it out, 
see what people are asking for, and see what people are talking about on there. This is really similar to your research on Quora and Just Answer, in that you're looking for patterns. You're looking for things like what types of questions and discussion topics keep coming up over and over again. What types of solution are people looking for? What types of solution are they already using? And of course, how would they improve these solutions? Once again, let me caution you that you shouldn't use this method in isolation. Instead, use it to confirm your other findings. The seventh and final method for finding out what your market wants is, wait, wait for it. That's right. You just ask them. Now, it's true that what people say they want and what they actually buy can be two different things. However, you can certainly survey your market in order to confirm your research. You can ask them about what types of solutions they're seeking, what solutions they're already using, what they like and don't like about those solutions, and what they would like to see in a product or service. If you don't have your own blog or another website, then you can use instant.ly to gain access to 12 million plus consumers that are sorted by age, gender, and other demographics. This service has good social networking integration, and its most basic services are free at this point. Once you've completed both your brainstorming and research, then you'll want to take a few minutes to review your research. That's what you'll find out how to do in Section D, and I'll see you there in just a minute. Section D, Reviewing Your Research. Now, before I go any further, I want to remind you of something important. There's a manual that accompanies this course, which includes worksheets to help you with the previous brainstorming and researching steps. Please take some time to complete the worksheets, as these tools will help you complete this process more quickly and easily. Some people complete these steps and only have a couple viable options, but most people end up with more ideas than they could pursue in a lifetime. In the next module, you'll find out how to assess these different ideas in order to determine which ones seem to be the most viable for you. However, if you're starting out with quite a few ideas, then you may want to whittle down your list a little bit to save time later. To do that, ask yourself these three questions about the ideas on your list. Which ideas seem to have the most profit potential at a glance? These are the ideas that seem to have a large, eager market and plenty of products and services being offered to the larger market. Okay, which ideas personally excite and interest you? Which ideas leap out to you as good possibilities? While you're primarily looking at these ideas in terms of profit potential, it's obviously helpful if you personally like the idea. I mean, you're going to be joined at the hip to this idea for a while. We might even say you're going to be married to this idea. You wouldn't get married to someone who looked hideous, and then you couldn't stand to be in the same room with for more than five minutes, would you? Of course not. Likewise, you don't want to get married to an idea that has your stomach turning and reaching for a sick bag, so choose wisely. Now rank your ideas from best to worst, based on your answers to those questions. When you start assessing the viability of your idea in the next module, you can start with the best idea on your list and work your way down until you find your million dollar business idea. Let's recap where we are in the next section and then you can move on to the next module. All right, here we are at section E, the recap of our module. Over the last several minutes, you've learned how to recognize the great ideas that are all around you, how to research those ideas, and how to review those ideas to create a short list. So whether you came to this course with a burning idea, or you didn't even have a clue where to start, at this point you should now have at least one, if not several, viable ideas. It's getting kind of exciting, isn't it? If you like what you've uncovered so far, then you're really going to enjoy the next module, and that's because you're going to find out if your idea really is a seven-figure idea. So, stretch a little bit, take a deep breath, and then jump right into the next module. Here we're going to talk about verifying your million dollar idea quickly and easily. And you do that by putting your idea under the microscope. You've got an idea, right? 
And if you're anything like me, this idea feels like it's just coursing through your veins. It's hopping you up with adrenaline, and I bet it's going to cause a few blissfully sleepless nights as you lay awake because your idea excites you so much. But before you unleash this idea into the wild, you need to scrutinize it a bit more. And as author Elizabeth Peter said, I have learned that particularly clever ideas do not always stand up under close scrutiny. In other words, maybe it's time to slap your idea on a glass slide and put it under the microscope. At this point, you can probably just imagine a bunch of MBA grads sitting at a table, wearing those silly pocket protectors, doing an old-fashioned SWOT analysis. There's nothing wrong with that. It works for them, right? But for you, speed is key. We want to develop your idea and release it into the wild as soon as possible. And that's not going to happen if you take the time to write up 100 pages of analysis. There is no need for you to spend months analyzing and researching. Okay, you just don't have to do all that. Because with the internet, you have everything you need right at your fingertips, just with a few clicks. You can do some quick and dirty analysis in just a couple of hours. And that means you can develop your idea in a quick weekend. And I'm not kidding about that. You see, you're not just looking for clever ideas. If you want clever, you could just look at how people get their 15 minutes of fame on YouTube, and usually it has a cat involved. You don't need much more than that. But that's not exactly what you want. What you're looking for are ideas that are potentially million-dollar ideas. And in order for an idea to turn into a seven-figure sum, you need to find out if there are a group of proven customers who are willing to exchange their cash for your goods or services. There's a variety of ways to do this rather quickly. These include researching with keyword tools, tapping into Google's tools, using Facebook's tools, checking out the competition, and determining the value of your prospective customer pool. So, make use of your excitement and let's do the research. We'll see you in the next section. Are you ready? It's time to stalk the search engines. Back in the last module, you used a keyword tool like the Google Keyword Planner or Market Samurai to find out what types of products and services people in your market were looking for. Now it's time to return to the keyword tool to find out how many times people in your market are searching for your specific solution. So what you need to do is go back into your favorite keyword tool and think about what types of queries people might put into a search engine to find your solution. Let's take a basic example. Let's suppose you decided to create an organic spray to get rid of aphids or other garden pests. You might look at search terms such as get rid of aphids, how to kill aphids, how to keep aphids out of the garden, destroy aphids, yeah, destroy the aphids, organic pest control, and other queries such as these. I'll go ahead and flip over to my browser again, and we'll look at the Google Keyword Planner for a couple more details on this. In our example, you've decided you wanted to create an aphid spray. So to narrow it down further, you'd want to look for queries that indicated the searcher was looking specifically for a spray, as opposed to a book or something like that. Uh, For example, you may look for search terms. Let's use aphid spray buy aphid spray and how about buy organic insecticide let's see if I got that spelled right looks good let it load up here and here we've got some direct results for things like aphid spray insecticides spray pesticides okay what you're looking for here is a large market, which would be indicated by a large monthly search volume. We'll talk about specific numbers and what to do with them in a later section of this module. But first, check out the next section to find out if your market is holding steady, trending upward, or declining. As I mentioned in the last segment, we're going to talk about tracking traffic trends. It's not hard to do, but let's think for a moment why we would want to do that. Just imagine that you've decided to visit a racetrack and bet on the ponies. 
You look at the race lineup and you spot a horse named Tipsy Tozy. Since you've imbibed a few pre-race beers and are feeling a little tipsy yourself, you figure it's got to be a sign, right? So you drop your life savings on Tipsy Tozy. I'm going to say that'll never happen, right? You'd never drop your life savings on a horse, at least not without thoroughly doing your research to make sure this horse is on a winning trend. Likewise, you shouldn't jump on your big idea until you've confirmed it's trending upward also. That's why you'll want to take a look at Google's Traffic Trend tool. And you'll find this tool at google.com slash trends. Google used to offer two tools, Google Trends and Google Insights. However, these tools have now been combined under one umbrella, which is called Google Trends. And that's what we're looking at on my browser here. As the name suggests, this tool shows you how specific search queries have been trending over the past nine years. What you're looking for is an indication that queries are stable or that they're going up. There's a lot of fun ways to look at data here, but you can use the insights part of the tool to explore in depth and it'll show you regional interest on your search term as well as related search terms. This is particularly useful if you intend to target a particular demographic living in a particular part of the world. And just to show you what I mean real quick, let's use our example of aphid spray. See what it pulls up here. This shows data from 2007 until the present. And we can see something really quick here. June, there's a big spike. May, June, another spike. June, every year in June, there's a big spike for aphid spray. So right at a glance, we know that this isn't necessarily trending upward, maybe slightly, but it's very seasonal. There's some ideas you have that you may not even realize would be seasonal that tend to be, and Google Trends will help you identify such things. Obviously, before you jump into your big idea, you're going to need to know if 90% of your sales come in June and you've got nothing coming in at all for eight months of the year. Okay, that's a big deal. But again, overall, you're looking for stable patterns. I would call this a stable pattern. Or you're looking for upward trending patterns. If you want an example of what a declining trend would look like, just think about typewriters or video rental stores. There are entire industries that decline over time, or even have become completely obsolete as technology takes them over. You want to be on the front end of something when it's growing, not on the back end when all the money's been made and it's drying up on the vine. Okay, lots of great info here. So meet me in the next section where you'll discover another powerful way to take a peek inside your market. As I'm sure you already know, Facebook has an absolutely enormous amount of data on their users. But did you know you can swipe Facebook's data? That's what we're going to talk about here. Facebook lets you have a look at some of their data in two ways. First, through their advertising platform, and secondly, through their graph search function. The problem with the graph search is that it doesn't give you exact numbers. Instead, if you perform a search, it just tells you if your search created over a thousand results. That can be helpful. That will show you if your target market is way too narrow. However, it won't show you if you have a big enough target market to support a million dollar business. So let's go ahead and take a peek at their advertising platform. And first things first, you've got to be logged in in order to view this information. So you'll need to have a Facebook account. You probably already do. If you don't, go ahead and sign up. And then you just go to facebook.com slash ads. And that'll bring you to a page that looks something like this. Okay. What you want to do is go ahead and click on create an ad. I'm actually not going to create an ad. I'm just getting in here to look at their data. It's going to ask you what kind of results do you want for your ads. And I'm going to say clicks to website. And we'll use good old example.com. If you are actually creating an ad right now, you can go ahead and load images in here. 
the type of text you want it to say, but we're gonna go down to audience to do a little spying on Facebook's data. This advertising platform is powerful because it shows you the reach you'd have if you'd placed an ad on Facebook. With this audience tool, you'll be able to get an estimate of the Facebook audience who is interested in your topic. For example, if you're interested in targeting just women who like cats, then your potential audience is over 12 million people. Okay, if you wanted to target men and women who are interested in golf, and we'll take cats out of there, you've got a potential audience of over 16 million people. Okay, these are both huge. Now we know golf is an absolutely enormous market. Just according to Facebook, over 54 million people have expressed interest in pages that are related to golf. And the 16 million number comes from how many of those people might actually see your ad of the 54 million. So numbers like that are just way too big to work with. So you would want to go ahead and narrow it down. We can use something like golf carts. Okay, now that makes a much more manageable number. You know, we're over a thousand, so we've got a decent sized market here. Potential reach, 8,400 people. Now we're talking. And at this point, you can go ahead and drill down and more narrowly focus your target market based on location, age, uh, gender, male, female, their broader interests, such as golf carts, or you can even choose like golf carts and let's say lizards for fun. Okay, a uh, surprising amount of people have expressed interest in lizards. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Okay, all this means is that you can get a really clear idea of just how big your target market is on Facebook. Spend some time playing around with the various parameters that you can use to narrow your audience. Okay, so far we've been looking at the market, but in order to get a clearer picture of this market, we also need to take a peek at your competitors. That's what you're gonna find out how to do in the next section. So take a little breather, I'll see you there in a minute. Let's talk about spying on the competition, okay? It's time to do your best James Bond spy impression. Now, trust me when I say you'll appreciate that I'm not gonna try to do a James Bond impression here. Grab a martini, shaken, not stirred. Grab your spy goggles and let's take a peek at what your competitors are doing. What you're looking for are gaps in the market, poorly positioned products, or other competitors whom you can dominate. Contrary to popular belief, a niche market that's barren of competitors is not necessarily a good find. Some people think it indicates there's a market to exploit, and you can almost see the dollar signs lighting up in their eyes, but that's not always the case. Sometimes a low number of competitors may indicate that the market isn't able and willing to spend money on solutions. In some niches, it's just a fact that there are no products in that niche simply because there is no money to be made there. In other words, don't be afraid if you see a lot of competition in a particular market. Consider it a good sign, because that tells you that a market is big enough to support a lot of products and competitors. And if you can find a gap in part of the market, meaning an underserved part of the market, or if you just position yourself well to attract a subset of the overall market, then you can carve off yourself a nice slice of the market. So what does a market gap look like? Here are a couple of examples. Example number one, there are several really popular competing apps available for the iPhone, but you don't see a similar strong competitor app being built for the Android. You might consider creating an app for that market segment. In our second example, maybe you see information products such as videos or home study courses that are targeted at beginners or advanced marketers, but there's a gap for intermediate members of the market you might make yourself a product to serve those in the middle. Those are just generic examples to get you thinking about your own niche. 
Okay, so let me give you a real example. Think about the types of cell phones you see today. Most of them are absolutely loaded with features, from cameras to advanced technology to run a variety of apps. They play music, they get on the web, video conference, and so on. It seems like it never ends. It seems like just phones have replaced like a hundred different things that you could put in your pockets. And it seems like each phone that hits the market has more and more features than the last one. These sorts of smartphones really appeal to the younger generation. However, a company named Jitterbug spotted a gap in the market. Namely, they noticed that there was a certain segment of cell phone users, usually older people, who weren't interested in all the bells and whistles typically found on later model cell phones and smartphones. This market just wanted to use the cell phone as a phone. Novel concept, I know. They weren't interested in texting, taking photos, or connecting to the web. They didn't want an app on their phone that played the guitar. They didn't want to play Angry Birds. And they'd rather cover themselves in honey and lie on a fire anthill than have an app that, well, we'll just say past gas. Simply put, this market segment just wanted a plain old phone. So Jitterbug filled that gap by creating a big buttoned, easy to use phone. Simple. In the United States, you can see their advertisements on TV and in magazines which appeal to older people. The point is, Jitterbug looked at the huge market of cell phone users and carved off a healthy niche for themselves by targeting older users and those who simply weren't interested in smartphones. That's what you call finding a gap in the market and filling it. Now, the good news is that you can do the same thing. You'll need to spend a little bit of time researching your market, though. Here are three quick and easy steps you can take. Step one, search Google. The idea here is to enter your main keywords into Google and then take note of the first two pages of competitors. You're not looking at these competitors necessarily in terms of search engine optimization. Rather, you're looking at their business model overall and you'll wanna ask yourself a couple of questions about your prospective competitors. Ask how have they positioned themselves and their products in the market? And also what segments of the market are they serving? And are there any gaps? Step two is checking out competing products. You won't uncover every popular product or business on the first page or two of Google. That's why you should take a trip back to Amazon and search their marketplace for competing products. Again, ask yourself how these products are positioned and if there are any gaps in the market. This information is going to come in really handy and save you some time when you enroll in the second course of this series, which is all about branding. Step three is to browse crunchbase.com. Crunchbase gives you statistics and history on some of the bigger businesses in your market. You can see what products or services a company is selling. You can discover the company's financial history. You can get an idea even of how much traffic the site gets. There's also a lot more available there. The information on Crunchbase will help you determine who the biggest competitors are in your market it gives you an idea of how profitable a particular market is. And it also gives you insight into a specific company. If you really want to replicate success, then study your competition using this tool and the steps mentioned above. Okay, over the last few sections, you've been gathering a lot of information with regards to your competitors and the niche markets they're serving. Now in the next section, we're going to pull all your research and data together to find out if you truly have a seven-figure business idea. See you there in just a minute. Earlier I mentioned the traditional way of starting a business, which includes tedious research and analysis such as the SWOT analysis. And as I mentioned, there's nothing really wrong with this sort of analysis, except that it just takes way too long. What we want to do is spend a few hours at the computer, crunch a few numbers, and make a quick decision about whether you have a seven-figure business idea or not. So set aside the idea of spending weeks analyzing the market potential. Instead, just grab a calculator and let's figure it out right now. I know, you were hoping this course wouldn't require math, right? Well, the good news is that you don't have to do anything hard, like figure out when two trains will meet if one leaves New York City with a tailwind and the other leaves Los Angeles with a hefty load of sumo wrestlers. We'll leave that for somebody else. So no worries. Instead, we'll crunch numbers in three easy steps. These are step one, 
you estimate the prospect pool. Step two, you estimate the value of this market as a whole. Step three, you estimate how much this market is worth to you. So let's look at each of these steps a little more closely. What you're going to do for this step is take some of the data that you uncovered in the preceding sections. For example, take a look at just the Facebook data and what sort of audience Facebook estimates for your market. You can certainly look at the data from multiple sources, such as looking at the data from both Facebook and your keyword research. However, if you do this, the key is to look at them separately. In other words, don't combine them. If you combine them, you're not going to have accurate numbers. And the reason why is if someone is on Facebook showing an interest in your topic, that same person is probably also searching Google for keywords related to that interest. The problem is here, you have no idea how much overlap there really is. Let me give you an example. If you see a reach of 200,000 people on Facebook who are interested in knitting sweaters for hamsters, and your main keyword is searched 200,000 times in Google, that doesn't mean you have a prospective market of 400,000. That's because you don't know how much overlap there is between the two sets of data. There could be zero overlap between the two data sets, but there more likely is a lot of overlap. It could even be that the same 200,000 people are searching on both platforms, and we just don't have any way of knowing which is the case. So again, look at just one set of data at a time, such as Facebook's estimated reach. Let's say for illustration purposes that you want to find out how many people have an interest in the topic of small business on Facebook. Using the advertising platform tool, Facebook suggests that you'd have an audience of approximately 1.9 million people. Now let's carve off a smaller segment of that population. Let's suppose we want to look specifically at how many people are interested in mobile marketing for small business. Facebook gives us an audience of around 175,000. It's much smaller than the overall market, so let's see if our idea is even viable. Take note of these numbers and we'll move on to the next step, which is estimating the value of this entire market. Okay, the second thing you want to do is consider about how much money the average person in your market is spending on these relevant products and services. Let's go back to the example of those who have an interest in small business, of which mobile marketers are a smaller segment. Just consider how much the average small business owner spends each month. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume it's an online business owner that has low overhead. Okay, domains, hosting, autoresponders, and other tools like that Let's say they spend about $750 a year. Employees or outsourcing, independent contractors, they spend about $40,000 a year. For product development, let's call it $25,000 annually. And advertising, and advertising, about another $25,000 annually. Again, these are just made up figures. The actual figures would vary a lot depending on the industry and what the small business owner is selling. For example, someone who's developing software and apps is likely to have a far greater product development budget than someone who's developing books. And of course, someone who sells physical products would also have manufacturing, stocking, and shipping expenses. So just realize these figures aren't made to represent any particular industry. Now, with that disclaimer out of the way, what we can see is that the average hypothetical small business owner spends over $90,000 annually. That's a good sign. Whether you're looking at the overall market, which includes the 1.9 million people interested in small business, or the smaller segment, which is those that we segmented off that are interested in mobile marketing, you can see that this is indeed a large and valuable market. So the next question is, what is this market worth to you? And that's what we're going to determine next. At last, the moment we've all been waiting for, we're going to find out now if you have a million dollar idea. Depending on how big the numbers were in the last step, you probably already know whether your idea has potential. But let's get a little more specific, all right? What you need to do next is estimate how much you'll charge for your product or service. One good way to estimate this is by looking at what your prospective customers are charging for similar products and services. 
Depending on what you plan on selling, you might see a wide range. For the purposes of this exercise, just choose a price that's at the low to middle end of this price range. And why would we want to choose the low to mid range? That's because if you can prove to yourself that your idea is viable at the low end of the price range, anything above that's just gonna be gravy. So let's suppose for now that you decide you want to sell products or services to mobile marketers for $50. Your next step is to go back to the data from step one, which is, remember, your estimated audience size, and multiply this by your estimated price in order to obtain a value for how much this market is worth to you. Since we're getting more specific, we're gonna look at just the mobile marketers on Facebook, which was an audience of 174,960 people. So let's do the calculations here. 174,960 people interested in mobile marketing times a $50 product equals $8,748,000. That's right, this is an 8.8 .8 million dollar idea. Now, there are a couple of points you've got to keep in mind. First, you're obviously not going to get anywhere near 100% market saturation. However, you're also looking at just one set of data from one site, which doesn't give you the full picture of your prospect pool anyway. That's why this is called a quick and dirty method. If you end up with a higher number like our example of the market being worth 8.8 .8 million, you can feel pretty confident that you have a seven-figure business idea even after you factor in real data regarding market saturation or your true reach. However, if you find that your calculations show your market is worth right around the $1 million mark, then you're probably going to want to dig a little deeper. That means doing further calculations to figure out what percentage of the market you can actually reach, how much it will cost you to do that, and what sort of conversion rate you can expect. Then you can decide if you truly have a seven-figure business idea. All right, we're well on our way here. Let's go ahead and recap in the next section. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground in this module. To make your research a whole lot easier, I've included some tools to help walk you through the process. You'll find these tools in the course manual. Once you've worked with these tools, then take another breather because you've done a lot of work to this point. In this module, you found out how to verify that you do indeed have a million dollar idea. You did this by taking a closer look at your market, by checking out your competitors, and running a quick calculation to see if there are even enough people willing to spend money with you to create a seven-figure business. At this point, you've got it. You've verified that you have a million bucks worth of potential waiting to be unleashed from this data. But you know what? Despite crunching some numbers, right now you're really still just guessing that your idea is going to grow wings and fly. You're just speculating. But don't worry about that. In the next module, you're going to release this idea out into the wild and let your customers vote with their wallets. So stretch, take a deep breath, get a cup of coffee or refill your water bottle, and I'll see you in the next module in just a few moments. It's time to test your million dollar idea this weekend. Consider this quote by P.W. Katniss. Once an idea is out and about, it can't be called back silenced or erased, any more than you could put the head of a dandelion back together after the wind has scattered its seeds. You can just picture it, right? That's good. That's because your next step is to release your idea out into the wild and let the wind scatter the seeds. This is truth time, where you're going to find out if some of your seeds are going to sprout and take root. You see, in the previous module, you looked at your market to see if your idea was worth a million dollars. But until you actually test out your specific product idea, you simply won't know for sure if people will buy your specific product. At this point, a lot of business owners make the mistake of investing thousands of dollars and months or even years of their time into product development. But guess what? You don't have to do that. In fact, you shouldn't do that at this point. Because here's the mantra that I want you to have from now on. Ready? Start small, but think big. You don't have to risk your life savings or an incredible amount of time in order to see if your dandelion seeds will sprout. You can get up and running fast by just starting small. Not only will you get some income rolling into your bank account quickly, 
but you'll also be able to determine really quickly whether your idea has legs or not. Best of all, you're in good company when you adopt the start small but think big philosophy. If you need an example, look no further than Steve Wozniak and his friend Steve Jobs, who together started the Apple company in Wozniak's garage. These two guys built a computer and then approached a retailer about selling their personal computer. The retailer ordered 50 units. Wozniak and Jobs were broke at the time, so they had to order the computer parts on credit in order to fulfill their first order. They started small with just one order, but Wozniak and Jobs thought big, which is why Apple dominates the market the way it does today. Or we can take another example of two entrepreneurs, Simon Hodgkinson and Jeremy Gislason. These two business partners brainstormed an idea one weekend that started off as a special offer for their existing customers. Okay, When they launched the idea less than two months later, they made $80,000. Within two years, their brainchild, called the Marketing Main Event, had generated $3 million in sales and hundreds of thousands of dollars in ancillary sales. So how did Simon and Jeremy turn a simple brainstorm into a $3 million business in less than two years? They did it by starting small and thinking big. And now that's what I'm going to encourage you to do also, by taking small, calculated bets. In fact, you've already done the calculations in the previous model. Now it's time to test out your idea in the real world. That's what you're going to discover how to do in the next section, and I'll see you there in just a few moments. In this section, you're going to learn how to test your idea quickly and how to do that with real customers. You know, launching a business the proper way takes time. That's because you need to draw up a marketing plan, develop your branding, and create a full-fledged product or service. But you know what? A lot of people I talk to jump with both feet into the planning stage of launching a business. Oh yeah, they're excited. They love the planning part. But the problem is, they love the planning so much that they never really get out of the planning stage. I've heard about people who spent weeks or months designing the perfect logo to put on their website and business cards, but they never made a dime because they never got past the stage of creating the logo. It seems kind of silly, but people really do this. I've even heard about people spending weeks deciding what titles to give themselves in their business. And while they were deciding whether to call themselves founders or CEOs or chief bottle washers, their competitors made money. The folks had nice titles for their nameplates and business cards, but they didn't ever manage to develop a product. My point is, I don't want you to slave over the details at this point. Instead, let's test your idea and let's scatter those dandelion seeds. Now, you've got two choices. The first option is to choose to test the market before your product is ready to go, or the second option is you can test a light or stripped down version of your product. What you decide to do depends on what you're selling and what sort of resources you have available. Option two, where you test a light version of your product, takes more time and resources, but it does tend to be a more accurate test. Option one is a quick and dirty way to get a pretty good estimate of the interest in your product, though. Let's look at each of these more closely. We're going to start with option number one, testing the market before the product is ready. That's right, you don't even have to have anything to sell in order to test your market. However, the key to making the strategy work is that your prospects need to think that they're actually going to buy something. Getting people to click a buy button is a lot better measure of interest as opposed to merely surveying people. Remember what we said earlier, that people may say they intend to buy something, but often they really won't. Getting them to click that buy button is a good way to test what they're really going to do. However, getting people to click a buy button isn't a 100% accurate measure of interest. That's because business owners who track their statistics know that not everyone who clicks the buy button actually ends up buying the product. Still, even if 100% of those who click a buy button don't necessarily buy, it's still a quick and dirty way to get a good estimate of interest in your product. So what you need to do is, first, create a sales letter. Second, run a quick advertising campaign. And third, track your results. Let me explain each of these steps in a little bit more detail here. The first step, creating a sales letter. Here you're going to create a sales letter as if the product was already complete. 
One bonus of creating this letter is that it really gets you thinking of what all benefits and features you'd like your product or service to offer your customers. And this is gonna help you create a better product. Now the key to this step is that you need to create a professional sales letter. If you don't know anything about writing good sales copy, then go to elance.com or another freelancing site and hire a professional copywriter to create the letter for you. The reason you wanna do this is because you don't want your test to be skewed negatively simply because you have bad sales copy. You can have a great concept for a product, but if the sales copy doesn't do its job, then you'll get left thinking that no one wants the product. Picture this. Imagine if several years ago, I told you I had a new whiz-bang gadget that you're gonna love, okay? You ask me what the gadget will do for you. I tell you that it'll take photos, but I also tell you that the photos won't be as great as your current camera, nor will you be able to store as many photos as on your camera. You'd probably laugh in my face and walk away, and I'd deserve it, because that sure is a lousy way to try to sell a cell phone with a built-in camera. Now, hopefully, if you wrote a sales letter, you wouldn't do such a dismal job of selling your product. But the truth is, if you don't already know how to write good copy, it's better to hire a professional. They know how to really sell your product so that you don't end up with a bad sales page that skews your results. So set aside the money needed to hire a copywriter so that your test is more accurate. Everything about the letter should look like a regular sales page. This includes having a buy button at the bottom of the page. The difference is that when your prospects click on the buy button, they're not taken to an order form. Instead, they see a page which tells them that the product isn't quite ready yet. Now here's the fun part. The page should actually be a squeeze page. That means that your prospects will get an opportunity to join your mailing list. That way, when you actually do launch your product, you've got a list of eager prospects who are already excited about buying your product or service. Your next step is to get real prospects in front of the sales page, and quickly. This usually means you'll need to use some form of paid advertising, such as pay-per-click marketing. I'll share with you now some of the best methods, okay? Be sure to check the workbook to get the links for the various ad programs. Also, the first method is to use Google AdWords. This is a good all-around testing platform. However, since people don't go to the Google search engine just for commercial purposes, you might see lower conversion rates here. The second would be purchasing Facebook ads. This is a good place to test if you're looking to get a sense of the coolness factor, quote unquote, of your product. Another is to buy Amazon ads. Because Amazon is such a big marketplace, this is a good one for testing a wide variety of physical products, digital products, or even services. It works particularly well for gotta have it now widgets, okay? How about eBay? This is a favorite place to advertise simply because you're advertising within a commercial environment. In other words, a very high number of the people seeing your ads are on the site to shop. LinkedIn ads seem to work particularly well for information products, such as workshops, seminars, and conferences in a geo-targeted area. You might try that. Uh, another one is buying Reddit ads, and that's a good place to test technical products and gadgets. When using these sorts of pay-per-click programs, the key is to bid on keywords that are as narrow and targeted as possible so that you get buyers in front of your sales page as opposed to people who are just kicking tires and looking for freebies. Let me give you an example of that. Let's suppose you're gonna sell some sort of weight loss app for the Android phones. The cool thing about this particular example is that both Google AdWords and Facebook ads now allow you to promote your apps directly to the relevant device owners. So for example, if you're selling the weight loss app to Android phone users, then only those with Android phones will see your ad on Google AdWords. Pretty nice, huh? Even better though, you can link your ad directly to the Google Play Store so people can buy and download your app in just a couple quick clicks. Now, while all of this is really slick, you still need to make sure you target your ads using good keywords. A keyword like Android app is way too broad because you don't know what kind of app the person wants. A keyword like free weight loss app is no good either 
because that's a query from a freebie seeker, not a buyer. A good example of a keyword is something like weight loss Android app, which specifies both weight loss and that it's for Android. If you mention something in your ad about the app being affordable, then you also are taking an extra level in weeding out the freebie seekers. One additional note, you might want to make it clear in your ad that your product is a paid product. This helps you further target your promotion so that you're attracting buyers rather than the freebie seekers. And here are four example phrases which signals to your prospects that you're selling something. Free shipping, discounted price, best price, PayPal accepted. Those all put the thought in the mind that you're charging for your product rather than giving something away. Once you've set up your advertising campaign, then you need to track your results. One way to do this is by using a tool like Google Analytics. You'll count each click of the buy button as a potential sale. You'll get further confirmation of interest from the smaller percentage of people who choose to opt into your mailing list. As mentioned, this isn't a 100% accurate way of gauging interest, because people can and do click the buy button without any intention of buying a product. Some people will click out of habit just because it's there. I'm actually kind of curious if you tried to click that button on your screen yet or not. All right, maybe it's not that easy, but take note. A good industry-wide guideline is to estimate that about 30 to 40% of people who click the buy button would have completed the sale. There are other factors that influence this rate, of course, and here's three of the biggest. Your industry. Certain industries simply have higher cart abandonment rates. Where the price is located is big. Your price should be prominently featured just above or below the buy button, or even right on the button itself. If it's not, then people will click the buy button just to discover the price, which of course skews your results. The usability of your site is important also. The bottom line here is that if your buy button or link isn't clearly labeled as a buy button, some people may click it even though they have no intention to purchase anything at all. If you keep these guidelines in mind, you can get a pretty good estimate of interest. However, if you want to use a slightly more accurate measurement, then test the market with a light version of your product. As I mentioned earlier, developing the full version of your product can not only be expensive, but labor intensive as well. But you don't need to develop a full version of your product in order to see if you've hit on a good idea. Instead, you can just release a light or stripped down version. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first example is you plan to develop a complex piece of software. You can create a light version with fewer features. This light version will take a lot less time for the coders to complete, so you can test the product more quickly. Example two, you plan to create a home study course. Before you do that, you release a short report or even a one hour webinar to gauge interest on the topic. Also recall the example I offered earlier where Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs built one computer and used it to garner orders. They didn't drive themselves into debt or spend months building dozens of computers before getting orders. Instead, they built one computer and schlepped it around town to test the market. Pretty brilliant if you ask me. Remember, start small, but think big. Now, once you put together a light version of your product, then you need to start selling it. To do that, you must take the two steps I described earlier, namely, you need to create a professional sales letter, and you need to drive traffic to your sales letter. Again, be sure to hire a professional copywriter if you don't know how to write sales copy. The last thing you want is for a poor sales letter to negatively affect your results. Then your next step, as outlined earlier, is to use a quick paid advertising method to drive traffic to your sales page. This includes Google AdWords, Facebook ads, eBay ads, Reddit ads, and LinkedIn ads. One of the reasons you'll want to do your test as quickly as possible is because once you've confirmed interest in your product, then you'll want to develop the full product as soon as possible. That's because your competitors are likely to get wind of the product you're testing. If they see that you have a winner, they might try to replicate your success by putting out a similar product. The point is, you want to be the first to market with your fully developed product. 
So don't start testing your light version unless you're ready to develop your full version immediately after your test. We'll talk more about getting your product developed in the next module. For now, let's wrap things up with this module in the next section. See you there. All right, let's go ahead and review what you've learned in this module. You had a choice of testing your market with just a sales letter or by testing it with a light version of your product. If you're not sure which one is right for you, use the worksheet in the course manual to quickly make that decision. There are two things that I want you to take away from this particular module. First, take action. Of course, starting a business takes a fair amount of planning, but the more doing you can accomplish alongside the planning, the faster you'll launch your business idea. And the sooner you unleash your idea into the wild, the sooner you'll find out if it's going to sink or swim. Since you've done your research, you're taking a calculated bet when you start testing your idea in the real world. That means you stand a very good chance of having your idea sprout and take root. What you're doing is walking a fine line. Kind of like walking a tightrope over the Grand Canyon, really. On the one hand, you need to do some research in order to help ensure you're pursuing a good idea. But on the other hand, you can't plan yourself into inaction. You can't sit around researching, analyzing, and working on just trivial details to the point where your idea never sees the light of day. You've got to be bold. You've got to take action. That's the first point. The second point I want you to remember is to start small, but think big. Just because you're taking action doesn't mean you need to complete every single step of your business launch before you unleash your idea on the world. Skip some of the steps in the interest of speeding your idea to the market. Once you see that the market is interested in your product, then you can go back and complete the necessary steps and put the whole plan together. For example, you don't need to have your business cards before you launch. You don't need to have a fully developed website with all the bells and whistles when all you really need is a simple sales page. As we've covered, you don't even need a fully developed product. Just get started, take action, and unleash your idea on the world. Soon you'll confirm that you do indeed have a great idea. Once you do that, then you can start developing your idea more fully, okay? That's what you'll find out how to do in the next module. In this module, we're going to talk about taking action as soon as possible. And we're going to look at the four following topics, making room for new ideas, capturing customer contacts, producing products lickety split, and building a bulletproof brand. If you have a good idea, use it so that you will not only accomplish something, but so that you can make room for new ones to flow into you. That's a quote from author and philosopher Deng Ming Dao. Yes, this quote applies to you right now, and it's true on two levels. First off, now that you've seen that your idea is viable, you need to do something with it. It won't do anyone any good if it never leaves your head or never leaves the planning stage. Think of it like this. You've planted the seed, but if the seed is going to sprout, you need to take action by watering it. Just like a seed, your ideas won't sprout or bear fruit if you don't nurture them. The second way that Ming Dao's quote is true is that once you start taking action on ideas, you suddenly get a lot more ideas. It's like fear melts away and gates open so that new ideas can flow freely into you. Maybe you started this course with one good idea. Maybe you didn't even have that much when you clicked play on the first video. But once you start taking action, you'll have an abundance of ideas flowing into you at all hours of the day and night. You just wait and see, okay? For right now, you need to focus on developing your business idea. And that includes doing these three things. Number one, you need to start building your mailing list. That way, once the product is ready, you have a list of warm leads to whom you can sell your new product. Number two, of course, you need to create the product. And this is where so many people get stuck. The good news is that you don't have to do it yourself if you're unable to or if you don't want to. Number three, you need to start working on branding and positioning, both of which are going to make you stand out from your competitors. Over the next three sections, we'll look at each of these development steps in a little more detail. 
So I'll see you in the next section in just a moment. In this segment, we're going to talk about capturing customer contacts. As you learned a little earlier in this course, you don't even need to have a product ready in order to test the market. All you need is a sales letter. And as you learned before, the sales letter should direct to a squeeze page. That way you can start creating a list of prospective customers. However, that's not the only place where you should have a subscription form on your site. You should also create an easily accessible public squeeze page where you can start collecting leads from people who might be interested in purchasing your product or service. Imagine for a moment that you're standing in one of those glass booths about to do a money grab. In just a few seconds, a bunch of paper money is going to start floating around you in the booth, and your job is to catch as many bills as you can in the next minute or two. Suddenly, there's a rush of air, and there's money everywhere, right? You happen to notice that most of them are $20 bills, but there are also a few $100 bills floating around. So tell me, what are you going to do? Do you wait for the $100 bills to float by, or do you grab everything that comes your way? If you're smart, you'll grab everything that comes your way. And that means you'll end up with a nice wad that includes both 20s and probably some of the 100s. The same applies here. Your customers are your $100 bills, but your prospects, who are people that may or may not buy, are our $20 bills. Your prospects are more numerous than your customers, and you want to grab as many as you can, which is why you need to start capturing their contact information as soon as possible. One good way to do this is to offer something valuable for free to your prospects. This freebie should be directly related to the product or service that you intend to sell. That way, when your product or service is ready to launch, you have a list of warm leads that you can sell to. So let me give you a couple of examples of freebies you can use to build your mailing list. Example number one. Let's suppose you intend to sell a weight loss supplement or vitamin. You can entice people to join your mailing list by offering a fat loss free report, which offers guidelines for helping people lose weight. Your report would plant the seed regarding how the right weight loss supplements can help people lose the weight more quickly. Another example, let's say you intend to sell a test-taking preparation app, which helps prospective graduate students prepare to take the GRE. To get people on your list, you can offer a free report which tells students what all they need to do in order to get into graduate school. Your free report would include an overview of the GRE test with sample questions. Okay, do you get the idea? You want to offer something valuable and desirable for free, something which is directly related to what you'll be selling. However, do take note that you're walking a fine line whenever you start giving away valuable products or information for free. On the one hand, you do want to give away something valuable. You want to use this freebie to build a relationship with your prospects and to show them that you really can solve their problems. On the other hand, you don't want to devalue your products or services. You see, the problem with offering a freebie is this. Some people associate freebie with no value. And so they'll associate your products or services as having no value or maybe a low value. So what's the solution to that? Well, one good way to approach your freebie is by offering something that only solves part of your prospect's problem. That way, they get a taste of the kinds of solutions you can deliver. Your partial solution gets them excited about purchasing your full solution, and you don't devalue your product or service, since you're only giving a portion of it away. So let me go over what you need to do in order to implement this strategy. The first thing you need is a squeeze page. This is a page which includes a sales letter to persuade people to join your mailing list, as well as the actual subscription form. The second thing you need is a strong reason for people to join your list. This is the freebie I was talking about earlier. You might offer a free report, software, app, tool, resource, webinar, audio recordings, video, multi-part e-courses, just about anything that's easy for you to deliver to your subscribers. The third piece of the puzzle you need is a mailing list manager. There are self-hosted solutions available. However, you may want to use a trusted third-party email service provider, such as getresponse.com, aweber.com, 
iContact.com, or any other reputable service. Take note that I've included a checklist in the course manual to help you implement this strategy. Okay, you don't have to remember it's all in your head. Go check the checklist. This checklist will save you a lot of time as you work through this process. So be sure to print off a copy of it before you start building your mailing list. For now, let me just give you an overview of the process. What you'll do first is create your freebie. Then create your squeeze page, which promotes this freebie. And then advertise the link to your squeeze page. In other words, you need to drive traffic to this page and get as many prospective customers in front of your squeeze page as possible. Now, can I ask you something else? Imagine your best friend recommends that you go to see a movie that just came out. You probably trust your friend's recommendation. So what do you do? Chances are you're going to go see the movie. Now what if a complete stranger grabbed your arm in the street and started going on and on about this movie? First thing you'd say is, whoa, 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 back off, man. Then you'd get out of there fast. And I'm going to guess that you wouldn't even think twice about whether you should go see the movie that the crazy old man was ranting and raving about. Likewise, the key to making this entire email strategy work is that you need to build a relationship with your subscribers. In other words, you can't just get these folks on your list and then leave them hanging until your product is ready to launch. If you do that, they'll forget about you. Your list will grow cold. You'll be like a creepy man on the street, and they won't take you seriously. Now, fortunately, building a relationship with your subscribers is easy. All you need to do is upload emails into your autoresponder and then set them to go out at predetermined intervals, such as maybe once per week. A lot of experts say it takes about 7 to 12 touches in order for prospects to start to get to know you. So loading up 7 to 12 emails in your autoresponder is a good place to start. You can have the first three or four messages go out every few days at first. And then you can settle into a once per week mailing. Now the next question. What should you be sending in these emails? Whatever you send, the key is that the content or promotions should be directly related to your upcoming product or service. Let me give you examples of the type of content you can send. You can send an email that lists one or more niche relevant tips. Or what about a how-to article? How about an email that whets your subscriber's appetite for your upcoming product or services? A teaser. How about an email that promotes related products or services? Or an email offering another related freebie? Or announcing a contest? You get the idea. The point is to offer valuable content so that your subscribers keep opening their emails from you. And the second point is to keep your name in front of your subscribers on a regular basis so that these subscribers grow to know, trust, and like you. So that's one thing you'll be doing after you've tested your market. Another big piece you'll be working on is creating the actual product. That's what you'll learn about in the next section, so I'll see you in a few moments. Producing products lickety split. You'll recall that earlier I told you that it was important for you to develop your product quickly. That's because your competitors might get wind of what you're working on, and the truth is, they might be working on something similar anyway, even if they know nothing about your product. So either way, you want to get your product to market first. Obviously, I don't know what you're developing, so I can't give you tips that are specific to your particular project. However, I can offer you these general tips and guidelines. The first tip, like I've said before, is remember that you can start small. Depending on what you're working on, you can release it in stages. In other words, you don't have to wait until it's completely done before you put it on the market. For example, if you're creating a membership site with multiple features, you can open the site early and charge a smaller fee. Another example, if you're creating a multi-part course, you can release chapters or single videos one at a time as you complete them. One more example, Let's say your idea is to start offering a series of conferences across the country. You can start with one local conference and build it out from there. You don't have to have an entire infrastructure in place before you get started. The second tip, you don't have to do all the work yourself. 
Does Donald Trump personally hand build all his investment products? Of course not. He hires experts to design and build them. Or let's take the example of Sir Richard Branson, who started a record shop in the 1970s under the brand Virgin. Since then, Branson's company has grown up to become the Virgin Group, which now consists of more than 400 companies in the areas of travel and entertainment. Do you think Sir Branson is flying his own planes for Virgin Atlantic, writing all the books for Virgin Books, or mixing up the beverages for his Virgin Cola companies? Absolutely not. It's plain that that is impossible. He outsources because his time is better spent looking at the big picture. Likewise, whether you're creating a book, a software, a physical product, or even a service, you don't have to do the work yourself. You can hire professionals using sites like elance.com. If you're not skilled in the task, then these professionals will obviously do a better job than you can. And better yet, outsourcing the task leaves you free to focus on other parts of the project. The key here is to do your due diligence. That means you shouldn't go with the first provider that you find, nor should you shop around just based on price. Instead, look at the service provider's portfolio, their ratings, their reviews and history to determine if this is someone who not only puts out good work, but is also known for being professional and reliable. It doesn't matter if someone does good work if they don't deliver it to you, right? The third tip, work faster, smarter, and better. Chances are your project is going to take more than a couple of days to complete. And that means if you work smarter, faster, and better, then you'll save yourself a lot of time, money, and frustration. Now, while you're working on putting your product or service together, there's one other thing you need to take into consideration. That is branding. That's what you'll learn about in the next section. So I'll see you there in a few moments. Branding. This section is about how to build a bulletproof brand. Imagine that you have two entrepreneurs who put out a similar product. These two entrepreneurs are equal in every way. Their products are equal. They advertise in the same places. They have the same great levels of customer service. Maybe they both enjoy initial success, but over time, one business owner's product sales continue to grow while the other sees declining sales. Any guess at all what may have caused the difference? In a word, branding. You see, some business owners skip over the idea of branding their products or businesses. Generally, there are two reasons why people neglect branding. The first reason people neglect branding is because they favor short-term sales over long-term gains. Building a brand takes an investment of time and money. A lot of business owners use their resources for direct sales in the short term. However, a good branding strategy pays off dividends over the long term. Just think about your own shopping habits or your friend's shopping habits. You'll see it's true. If you're about to buy something like laundry detergent, with all else being equal, you're probably going to buy the brand you already know and trust. The second reason some people neglect branding is because they simply don't understand it. Many people think branding has to do with coming up with a slogan and a logo. But branding is so much more than that. Branding is about creating a feeling. For example, Rolex is built on a brand that's all about wealth, right? About power and sophistication. People will drop $20,000 on a watch just to have that feeling. Or look at something like baby products. Baby products are often branded based on feelings of love and security. Parents buy the brand that makes them feel like they're providing both extra love and security for their little baby. The point is, you're not creating this product as a short-term moneymaker. Are you? No. You don't want to just shove a few dollars in your pocket for a couple of months and then move on. Instead, you want to build something that lasts. You want to make an impression on your prospects and customers. You want to give your prospects and customers a reason to buy from you. That's what branding and positioning can do for you. So what I suggest you do first is go back into spy mode and look up your top competitors. Then ask yourself what kind of feeling are they trying to convey to their customers. Then think about what type of feeling you'd like to convey to your customers. That is, 
How do you want them to feel when they're using your products or services? Secondly, ask yourself how your product packaging, slogan, colors, logo, copy, and everything else can help to convey this feeling. Let me give you an obvious example here. Okay, if you sell baby products and you're looking to convey a feeling of love and family, then a bright gold and black color scheme is not going to help you with that goal. Instead, you'd look to softer colors, such as soft pinks, blues, yellows, greens, and other pastel colors. Again, keep in mind that branding is not just about colors and logos and slogans. It's about creating what? A feeling. Your colors, logos, and slogans are just tools that help you create that feeling. As you might suspect, this is a huge and extremely important topic. That's why we've created a complete video course that focuses entirely on this topic alone. Inside that course, you'll discover everything you need to know about building a brand that helps you crush the competition and virtually guarantees your long-term success. So what's the bottom line here? If you're building a business for the long term, then you can't afford to ignore branding. Now, let's go ahead and do a quick recap, and I'll see you in the next section. Let's tie it all together, and this won't take long. Getting an idea and testing it really gets the blood pumping and the adrenaline flowing, especially when you realize you're sitting on a seven-figure idea. Once you figure that out, though, then it's time to roll up your sleeves and get to work. And as you just learned in this module, you need to do three things. Number one, you need to start collecting leads. Don't make the mistake of waiting until your product is complete before you start looking for prospects. Did you hear me? Find them now. Get them on your mailing list and start building a relationship with them. Then you'll have buyers lined up on the day you release your product. Number two, you need to create the product or service. You need to do it well, but you also need to get it to market quickly. That's why outsourcing is often a good choice. Number three, you need to start building your brand. That's because your brand is going to seep into everything you do, from the way you create your product, to the way you package it, to the design of your site. In fact, even the way you answer a customer service inquiry is going to be influenced by your brand. So it's a good idea to establish your brand somewhat early in the process. We're almost done. We've only got one module left. So go ahead and watch it now. We'll see you in just a moment. All right, you did it. Now it's time to wrap it all up. Victor Hugo said, There is one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. That's where you're at right now. One solid idea, one intense weekend, one million dollars. You've thought up the idea, you've scrutinized it to make sure it has a million dollars worth of potential, at a minimum, and if you haven't already done so, soon you will test your idea by unleashing it on your market. It's an exciting time. You might be living on pure adrenaline for a few weeks. Your idea is going to take almost an obsessive hold on your mind as you start refining it, developing it, working on it, but that's the key. You need to take action. Your idea will just remain an idea if all you do is think about it. And that wraps up this course. You've got your idea, so your next step is to figure out your branding and start building your business. This is where it gets fun.